As we saw in the last episode of this series, the Triassic was a period of profound evolution with existing phyla diversifying into whole new orders of animals. Most famous of these were the dinosaurs and pterosaurs, which come from common stock. In the last video, we looked at the wide variety of crocodilomorphs. To give you some idea how diverse that group is, we saw the phytosaurs, or pseudo-crocodiles, and now we'll click on Suchia, Latin for crocodile. And from there, we'll click on Mesoeur Crocodilia, and we get this view. So, yeah, there's quite a few species here. And most of these are extinct, remember. How many species of alligators, crocodiles, and caimans do you think we have left? Uh, most of these in the fossil record didn't look anything like that. Both of these, for example, were fully terrestrial and looked a lot like dinosaurs. Now we'll back up and glance at the other side of that split between the crocodilish animals and the more bird-like Avimetatarsalians, beginning with aphanosaurs like Teleocrator. This thing comes from the early Triassic before the first dinosaurs, but you already see where this is headed. It doesn't just look like a dinosaur, because remember, there were other archosaurs that looked a bit like that too, including some crocodilomorphs. In addition to the superficial resemblance, there are important physical characteristics that this thing shares only with the more advanced archosaurian subgroup known as Ornithodira. There was a split there too. On the one side we have dinosauromorphs like Lagosuchus, also known as the rabbit crocodile because it was thought to hop around like a kangaroo. And then we have Celosaurids, which were almost but not quite dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are defined primarily by their hips, or how the legs connect to the pelvis. And even if some of them did hop around initially, they obviously traded that in for fleet feet on two legs, or they returned to a quadrupedal gait on four columnless legs, bearing massive amounts of weight. On the other side of Ornithodira, we have Scleromachus, which was a tiny carnivore, only a few inches long. Again, the hind legs are so long that it is believed that these hopped about, but they would have been much better at it than dinosaurs, because these were tiny, agile, and evidently energetic, and so lightweight that they'd be able to comfortably survive falling from a pretty significant height, if they could only control their fall like so many gliding animals had already done. They also have physical traits placing them at the base of, or basal to, pterosaurs. So one of the few transitional species we have left to find is this one, where paleontologists hypothesize that the first pterosaurs used membranes on their hands to control the direction of their fall and the speed of their landing, which of course would eventually lead to powered flight at which time the arms would become the primary means of propulsion and would then grow longer than the legs. And one trait that we see, not consistently, but frequently recurrent in different lines of tetrapods are these disproportionately long hind legs. Ideally, all four legs should be about the same size, and we never see oversized front legs, unless they're also arms or wings, because otherwise there's no practical advantage in oversized front legs. But oversized back legs, have occurred repeatedly in a number of independent lineages. Look at iguanas, for example. In the Triassic, they were lizards, crocodilomorphs, and ornithodirons all trucking about with back legs bigger than their front legs, especially when their legs were in a load-bearing position, vertically supporting the body from below, and there was a long tail to drag along. And then the combined weight of the body and tail would be balanced on powerful back legs, making locomotion easier. In fact, it's the same principle for early steam locomotives that had overly large back wheels. Having overly large back legs left some animals literally teetering on bipedalism. Taking off from a hind stand doesn't just look quicker, it often is a quicker takeoff depending on your build. And sprinting this way aids both predator and prey, as is demonstrated by this basilisk who can actually run on water. This is because their legs are sprawled out to the side such that their feet do this wax on, wax off motion, which is the same motion for swimming. Remember that lepidosaurs and archosaurs are on opposite branches of the reptile family tree, separated by a few intermediates that didn't have this trait, so it evolved independently. Euparcaria, a karyotype of ancestral archosaurs, may have run the same way, but its pelvis allowed it to walk in a more upright position than any lizard. And this is a trait that we see continued in more advanced archosaurs and some wannabe mammals, beginning with Prosostrodon, which represents the next clade we want to look at. They had a number of transitional features in addition to some that we still have now. For example, Prosostrodon had slight adaptations in the pelvis which allowed for hind leg dominant motion. Not necessarily running faster on their hind legs because all four legs were the same length, but they have the ability to stand and even take a few steps in an upright position. 
And while that may not seem like much, this is advantageous because they were significantly smaller than their ancestors used to be. So they have to jump up and climb much more than their larger predecessors ever could or had to. And prosostrodontids were only about as big as possums and probably looked like them too. They still weren't mammals quite yet. But they looked like the most primitive mammals we have left today, like possums or shrews or the venomous selenodon. They were also among the last of our saber-toothed ancestors, so they might remind you a bit of this character. Although Scrat here was depicted like a squirrel, which is a rodent and therefore shouldn't have canines. Pachygenelus is another prosostrodontid with both an articular quadrate and dentary squamosal jaw joint, similar to that of some early mammals. Only mammals have dentary squamosal articulation. All other tetrapods have articular quadrate articulation. Thus, the jaw of Pachygenelus can be seen as transitional between non-mammalian synapsids and true mammals. Because the old reptilian jaw joint and the new mammalian jaw joint are both there, very close together, and working in tandem. There's also a coronoid process from the dentary or jawbone extending up inside the zygomatic arch, just like we have now. And all this and other changes in the shape of the jaw allows for a much more versatile movement. We're now seeing the culmination of transitions that began with probenonathus, continuing through chinoquodontids, and becoming complete in prosostrodids. Much of vertebrate paleontology is all about teeth, and this is a good example of that. Other features of pachygenelus that are shared with true mammals, like us, is plesiomorphic prismatic enamel, or enamel arranged into a microstructure of strengthened prisms. The number of incisors between the canines has been reduced to four, and the cheek teeth behind the canines have regular wear facets indicating precise occlusion. And those cheek teeth are now double-rooted. All of this is just like our cheek teeth still are today. So having all these traits as we just described, in addition to the full list given in previous episodes, do you understand why you're classified as a prosostrodent? I know that sounds like rodent and you're probably worried that your ancestors look like this guy, but not so squirrely. <laughs>